Uh, do any of you have any questions before we start today? Okay, it says Claire is talking, but I don't hear her voice. Anybody have any questions? No, okay, I'm gonna, I am going to start the lecture. We're gonna be discussing chapter 11 today. And then uh, tomorrow, Friday at 11 a.m., I will give another lecture on chapter 11. It'll just be working problems from the end of chapter stuff. As I had said a week ago, we had to meet two, two days two Fridays um, in order to have enough time to get through the material. If you recall, last Friday I gave a lecture. Of course, I post them online so you can see them if you can't attend live. And uh, so tomorrow I'll give, we'll finish up chapter 11. And then next week we will have Tuesday and Thursday for chapter 12. And then the following week is, is finals week. Um, Sometime within the next week, I will post a practice exam for exam three and uh, with the solutions to the practice exam, just like I did for exam two. All right, let me share my screen and let's discuss chapter 11, which is uh, stockholders equity. All right, so let's see, corporations. A corporation, the key thing about a corporation that makes it different from a sole proprietorship or a partnership, if you recall at the beginning of the course, we discussed three forms of, three ways to organize a business. You could organize a business as a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation, and the biggest difference between a corporation and the other two is that it is a separate legal entity. It's an entity in and of itself separate from its owners. So what happens is the founders of the corporation, if they, if they're wanting, so they, they want to start a corporation, they have to go to their local state government. So the, the state in which they want to, make the corporation a legal entity, they have to approach them and file what are known as articles of incorporation. So it's a lot of paperwork. And in, those, in that paperwork, it defines the structure of this entity, what their purpose is. And also the state gives the entity, the state authorizes how many shares the entity can sell of stock. So if the state government approves it, then the founders, they will elect a board of directors and that board of directors will develop the corporation's bylaws and all these things will be documented, a lot of paperwork done. But the key thing here is that the entity itself, the corporation, it's a separate legal entity, separate from its owners. And in order to establish a corporation, you have to approach the state government, the state in which you're located. A lot of corporations are actually incorporated legally in the state of Delaware. And the reason for that is um, Delaware has very nice uh, tax benefits. So the state will tax the company on their income. Obviously, the federal government taxes corporations on their income. But a lot of corporations who actually practice their business in other states. They actually are selling lots of their products, say in California. Uh, they're actually legally incorporated in the state of Delaware. So that's an interesting fact that you might wanna know. Not something you have to know for an exam or anything. All right. So in order to obtain money to begin operating as a company, 
right? There's, we talked about various ways to raise funds. Probably the best way to raise a large amount of money quickly is to offer ownership in your newly formed company. So you guys heard Facebook went public a few years ago. They, they existed as a website, but they weren't a corporation until a few years ago. And they decided to go to, uh, you know, incorporate themselves. I'm not sure which state they're incorporated in, probably Delaware. But um, they decided to um, make their stock publicly available. And so their, their, their stock is traded on the, I think, NASDAQ. Uh, so that's a separate thing, how to get your stock on one of the three major stock exchanges, the NYSC, NASDAQ, or Amex. You actually have to approach the exchange, and there's various uh, requirements that the exchange has that you have to meet before, you can, before they will list your stock on their exchange to be traded. So once you are on an exchange, uh, one of the main requirements the exchanges have is that your income or your profit or your revenue, I think it's a revenue requirement, your revenue has to be at least above some minimum threshold per year or else they won't list you. You can't just be like a little mom and pop gas station. I believe for the NYSE, you have to have yearly revenue of at least 25 million. So you gotta be big enough, you know. Once you're on the exchange, then the way you raise money as a corporation is you sell your stock. The people who buy your stock are called uh, owners, shareholders. And that's how you get your initial um, big inflow of cash. It's called your, you know, when you first go public, the initial public offering, IPO. Facebook raised a ton of money when they went public back in, uh, I can't remember what year they went public actually, but in 2012 or something. Here's the structure of a corporation. We had the owners or the stockholders. These, these individuals, for each share of stock they have, that gives them one vote, they have voting rights, and they elect the board of directors. The board of directors, they establish the overall policies of the corporation. They declare dividends. They decide if dividends are going to be paid in a given year. And they're the ones that hire the, or select the uh, individuals that are gonna make the main decisions within the company. So the CEO, CFO, the vice president, and so forth. These are the officers that implement the operating policies and manage day-to-day -day operations. They are appointed or elected by the board of directors who are voted in by the shareholders. Um, and then these individuals, we will hire employees. And the employees are the ones that execute the management's operating plans and procedures. So this is the hierarch hierarchical structure of a corporation. What are some advantages of the corporate form of organization? First, it's a separate legal entity, it's separate from its owners. Uh, and how is that an advantage? Well, because this separate legal entity implies limited liability, each shareholder, each owner, is only liable for the amount of money they put into the company. They're not liable for any corporate debts. So if the corporation goes bankrupt, because it's a separate legal entity, any liabilities they have that can't be satisfied by the assets that they have. So there's an excess of liabilities over assets. If that happens and they go bankrupt, they owe a bunch of money. Um, the individual owners aren't liable for the, those debts. Those debts are not the owner's debts, they're the corporation's debts. And again, the corporation is separate from its owners. So that's a very attractive advantage uh, of the corporate form of organization. This is unlike a partnership. If you organize as a partnership, say two people go in, two doctors go in together to form a private practice partnership, and say one of the doctors, say they both put in 500,000 to start it, um, and say one of the doctors, you know, say that partnership takes out some loans, right? This practice takes out some loans and say 10 years into the practice, the practice goes bankrupt. 
and say one of the doctors passes away. The other doctor, guess what? Is he liable for only the 500,000 that he initially put in? No, he's liable for the 500,000. He's liable for any loans that the partnership has because he's not separate from the partnership. He is the partnership. The partnership isn't a separate legal entity outside of him. So this is one with a corporation, it's, it's different. A little less risky. Another advantage is um, when you organize as the corporate form, as a corporate form, there's nice transferability of ownership. So if you want to increase, so if you're an owner and you want to sell ownership, you just go and sell your stock on, a, on the exchange. Somebody else will buy it. If you're not an owner and you want to own part of the company, their stock is publicly traded. You can go buy it. You can buy as much as you have money to buy, subject to some constraints, which we don't, we won't go into here. Also, um, suppose you know the CEO passes away. You know some of the key shareholders die. Does the company die? No, it's a separate legal entity. It's still the company, even if all the owners die. You just have new owners. The company still exists. So continuity of existence. Um, and companies have a great ability to raise capital quickly because, because of these public exchanges that they're listed on. What are some disadvantages of the corporate form? Uh, corporations are big, so there are a lot of costs. They're subject, uh, their income is subject to being taxed. And so this is something that's known as, I don't think the PowerPoints go into detail about this, but I will. Um, double taxation is one of the often cited disadvantages of the corporate form of organization. What do we mean by double taxation? Excuse me. So every dollar the company makes as income, so $1 of net income is taxed by the federal uh, and state government, governments, and so that's the first taxation, and here comes the double taxation, and assuming um, the corporation pays part of this dollar as a dividend, which they do not have to do, by the way. Companies don't have to give dividends, but a lot of them do. So whenever they pay part of this dollar as a dividend to their shareholders, to their owners, guess what? The IRS, <laughs> or the federal government, uh, taxes this as part of their, their being the owners, individual income. So the dollar is taxed as corporate income by the federal government at whatever tax rate they impose. Under Obama's presidency, the tax rate was 35%. Under the new presidential regime, the tax rates have dropped all the way down to 15%, I believe. And then once the company pays, if they pay a dividend out of that dollar, then say you get a dividend. Is that taxable whenever you file your tax return? Of course, that's one of the questions on the 1040. You know your 1040 tax. I don't know if you guys have ever done taxes, but if you have a, you know, if you have done taxes, you know what the form 1040 is. It's the form you fill out for your taxes. And one of the questions is, did you receive any dividends? If you did, you're going to have to pay tax on it. So this dollar gets taxed twice. So that's one a big disadvantage of the corporate form of organization. Obviously, companies are subject to lots of regulation, supervision. All right, let's see. Each of the following is an advantage of the corporate form, except 
anyone have any idea? You can just put it in the chat. Anyone? Mark says taxation. Right, that's a disadvantage. The other three are advantages. Thank you, Mark. All right, let's talk about stock. Par value. What does par value mean? So par value is a term um, that in, early, in the early history of the, the New York Stock Exchange, which was the first exchange to, to essentially be the, that middleman between you know, company and potential shareholder. It's the one which uh, facilitated that, that exchange. Um, par value at that time was determined by them and it had more significance than it did than it does today. Today it doesn't have much significance. Back then it had some legal implications. So if a company gave you a share of stock and the par value was say ten dollars, that means that they and I'm not a history buff, but I believe that, that had some significance in the sense that um if at any time you wanted to go back to the company and give them that share back, they had to at least give you $10, something along those, along those lines. But today, par value doesn't mean that at all. Par value actually doesn't really have a meaning. And so, but, but it is still set. And, the, and in terms of the accounting, we have to consider par value still. I believe it's just because back then, when, you, when, people, when things first started, par value was of significance and the rules were created around that. And now that par value is of little significance, the rules haven't been changed to address for that. So what's happened then, the companies, they're allowed to, they are allowed to set the par value or they're the state government in which the company is, whatever state the company is incorporated in, that state gets to tell them what par value they can set, but usually the states allow the company to set the par value since it's of little significance today. So companies usually set the par value, par value very low, like a number 0 0.01, one cent. It's not related to the market value or the issuance price. In fact, um, some companies set the par value really, really low, like Starbucks par value, each share, the par value they set 0 0.000001, something like that. And some states permit companies to issue stock with no par value. All right, there's two types of stock the company can issue. Two types of capital stock. Um, we'll talk about it's common stock and preferred stock. But regardless of which type, um, this needs to be understood. So. There's this number of shares that the company is authorized to issue. This is set by the state. The state tells them how many shares they can, they, they can issue. It's the maximum number of shares. Now, what happens if they issued all, all the amounts that they could issue? So suppose they had issued, they issued a million, they wanna issue more. Well, then they have to go back to the state and ask them to, ask the state if they could be authorized to issue more. And the state usually agrees and says, yeah. So the number of authorized shares is the maximum amount they can issue. And then we have the shares that they've issued. So say they issue 800,000. These are shares that, they've been, that have been issued to the shareholders. The shareholders, at one point in time, they were issued, they were sold to the shareholders, which means that 200,000 of the authorized shares have not been issued, have not been sold. All right. Now of the shares that have been issued to the shareholders, we have say 700,000 of them are, are outstanding, which means the, sh the shareholders still own them. And what about the other 100,000? If the shareholders don't own them, who owns them? The other 100,000 are shares called treasury shares. These are shares the company has bought back from the shareholders. If they bought the 100,000 back, then in this example, the company 
still could issue these 200,000, which they haven't issued, and they could reissue these 100,000 of treasury shares because they bought them back. So th that's the idea. So underst understand what authorized shares are, what issued shares means, unissued, outstanding, and then treasury shares. So two types of capital stock, there's common stock and there's preferred stock. Uh, the basic type is common stock. Um, if there's only one type of stock, some companies only have only issue one type, it's going to be common stock. But often companies also, also issue preferred stock. Um, common stock has voting rights. Uh, several, if, you, if you're a shareholder and you own common stock, you have several rights. You have voting rights, you have the right to receive dividends. Um, you have the preemptive right to purchase new, share, new shares to maintain proportionate ownership in the company. So that's a key thing. This right um, prevents your, your ownership in the company from being diluted, right? What if a company, what if you currently, um, so it prevents your ownership from being diluted. So this right uh, does this. So what if a company, um, say there's 100, 100 shares outstanding. And you own 10 of them. So your percent ownership is 10%, 10 divided by 100. Now suppose the company um, sells 100 more shares to other shareholders, to new shareholders, right? They issue 100 more. So now there's 200 shares outstanding. And you still only own 10 of those 200. So now your ownership is 5%. Your ownership has been diluted. So you have the right, when the company issues these new 100 shares, you have the preemptive right over one of those new shareholders that's, that's thinking about buying the shares. You have the right to buy, buy them so that your ownership, your proportionate ownership stays at 10%. That's the idea. You don't, we don't have to go any more technical than that, just as long as you get the idea. And also common shareholders, they have a leftover or a residual claim on corporate assets in the event of a liquidation. So if the company goes bankrupt, the first thing that's done when the company goes bankrupt is the legal people come in and they liquidate the assets, which just means, well, all the cash is already liquid. And then any asset that's not cash, they try to sell it and get cash. So they have this big pile of cash. With this pile of cash, they satisfy all the liabilities the company has. And if there's any leftover cash after they've done that, that cash is distributed to the common shareholders in proportion to how many shares they own. So the more old shares you own, the more cash you get. Often though, when a company is liquidated, um, the, li the, the, li the liabilities are greater than the assets. So there's nothing left over. Another type of stock, or the second type of stock, is preferred stock. Preferred stock, the reason it's called preferred is because this type of stock gets dividend preference. That's the main attractiveness. So if you're a preferred shareholder and a company issues or declares a dividend in a given year, you get, you get your share of the dividend first. And if there's any left over, if there's any money left over, then the common shareholders will get it. If the stock is cumulative preferred stock, then any dividends and arrears must be paid to the preferred shareholders prior to the common shareholders receiving any dividend in this year. So dividends and arrears are dividends that were omitted in past years. So say we're at year T and in year T minus one, the company did not give a dividend. In year T minus two, they did give a dividend. 
we're in year T. Suppose they want to give a dividend in year T, and they have both common and preferred shareholders. Well, in year T, they first have to pay the dividend to the preferred shareholders for year T minus one, because no one got a dividend in year T minus one. And then in year T, they have to pay whatever's left over dividend to the preferred shareholders. And then finally, anything left over to the common shareholders for year T. That, that's if the preferred stock has the cumulative privilege. Not all preferred stock is cumulative. Um, and asset distribution preference. If you own preferred stock, you have preference over the common shareholders in corporate liquidations. And then there's other features of preferred stock. Some preferred stock can be convertible into common stock. Like if you have one share of preferred stock, it could be convertible into three shares of common stock, something like that. You, you could have access to special dividends if it's called participating preferred stock and so forth. Don't worry about this too much. Uh, this is a poorly worded question. Which of the following applies to common stock relative to preferred stock? I, the question's implying that, you know, which of these things applies to common stock but not to preferred stock? That's not what, that's not the right question. So I would say, which of the following is true of common stock? Uh, voting rights, shares in the corporation's net income, the right to a dividend, if the company decides to give a dividend. And, but what is not true of common stock is dividend preference. They don't have dividend preference over preferred shareholders. So D is right. A and D are both right. So D. All right, let's talk about how to account for issuing issuances of stock in terms of the journal entries. All right, here's an example. Assume Lester Corporation issues 100 shares of $100 par value preferred stock for $13,000. Notice $100 par value per share times 100 shares is $10,000, not $13,000. Suppose they also issue 100 shares of no par. Don't worry about this. No par common stock for $3,000. So there's two journal entries here, one for the preferred stock issuance, one for the common stock issuance. Let's do the first one. We're gonna debit cash for 13,000. Lester receives 13,000 in cash. Then we're gonna credit preferred stock for the par value. 100 times 100 shares issued times $100 per share. So credit preferred stock for $10,000. And then we need another credit. We're going to credit additional paid in capital preferred stock, $3,000. Or paid in capital in excess of par value preferred stock. That's another way to say it. Abbreviated APIC, additional paid in capital or you can call it paid in capital in excess of par. So what's happened here is um, the market value of each preferred share must have been $103. The par value is $100. The additional paid in capital is always a difference between the market value and the par value. So the difference is $3 a share times 100 shares gives the $3,000. So maybe I can write that up here. APIC, additional paid in capital, is always the difference between uh, market value and par value of the shares. So that's the journal entry for the preferred shares. And then what about the journal entry for the 100 shares of common stock they issued? Now the common stock, it said had no par. So there's not gonna be any additional paid in capital in excess of par, because there is no par. 
So we would just debit cash for 3,000, credit common stock for 3,000. Notice that in, up in the first journal entry, preferred stock is credited for par value. Second journal entry, common stock credited for essential, well, in this case, there is no par value, but you could think of it as par value. You don't credit preferred stock for market value. That would have been 13,000. Stock splits. What's a stock split? Well, we have two types. We have a forward stock split and we have a reverse stock split. Forward stock split just increases the number of outstanding shares and each share uh, proportionately reduces in value. Stockholders equity is not remains unchanged with a stock split whether it's a forward one or a reverse one. So here's a forward uh, stock split example. Savannah issues a two for one stock split. At the time they say that they're doing a two for one split, there are 2000 shares that are outstanding. Each share has $1 par value and it's common stock that's outstanding. So all that means is if you own a share, you now own two. So after the stock split, there are, that's a typo, there are 4,000 shares outstanding. And yeah, so if you own a share, you each, you now own two, but each of your two shares now is worth, instead of $1 each par value, it's 50 cents par value each. So your, your overall ownership dollar wise hasn't changed. Hopefully that makes sense. What's the value of Savannah Corporation's common stock before the stock split? What's the value of Savannah Corporation's common stock after the stock split? Same value, right? Those are the same. That's a stock split. And it doesn't have to be a two for one. It can be a three for one. It can be a four for one. You might wonder, what are some reasons why companies would want to split their stock? Uh, often what happens is when they split their stock, since that by definition makes, uh, makes it so that there's more shares outstanding, just by definition. And so what often hap what happens is the market value per share. Not only does the par value per share by definition just decrease, but the market value per share uh, decreases proportionally as well. And so companies whose stock price gets really high, uh, for example, take Apple. Uh, maybe back in the mid 2000s, 2010, I believe, their stock price had gotten really high, up around six, seven hundred dollars, and the average person couldn't afford to buy a share of Apple, and so they did a stock split um, to bring the price per share in down down in line with um, the market value would would drop after their stock split to a number around eighty hundred dollars where somebody could actually afford to buy a share. Now, company now. Um, that's not as necessary to do because most brokerage houses, you can buy fractional shares. Before you could only buy a whole, a whole share, you know, integer values of shares, but now you can buy fractional shares. So it doesn't really matter what their price is per share. Say the price for a share is $1,000. You just, if you can only afford hundred dollars, you just buy a 10th of a share and you can do that now. So now that reason doesn't exist as much. There are other reasons why companies may want to split their stock. The book talks about them. And then of course the reverse stock split, this increases the company's par value and it reduces the outstanding shares. So, so for example, if they um, issue, a, I don't know how, how you would state it, like a one for two, instead of a two for one, if they issue a one for two reverse stock split. Suppose, suppose Savannah issued a one for two reverse stock split on their 2,000 outstanding shares. After the stock split, uh, there are now 1,000 outstanding shares. And each share's par value is $2. So again, owner's equity doesn't change. If you had a share before the stock split, then after the reverse stock split, 
you now have half of a share. But your half of a share is worth twice as much as your whole share before. So you have the same amount. Um, I can give a reason. There's a big reason why companies will do a reverse stock split that I can talk about that I think you might find interesting. It's not on the exam. Um, one of the main requirements that the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ have for a company to remain on their exchange and be publicly listed is their stock price has to be has to maintain a minimum level. So if their stock for NAS for the NYSE, I believe it's five dollars a share, or it might be one dollar a share. If the stock price falls below, say five dollars a share, and remains below five dollars a share for more than ninety days, the company gets delisted, and no longer can be traded on the exchange. And so. If a company's stock price is doing poorly, they'll just do a reverse stock split and that'll make the market value shoot back up and it'll keep them above that minimum so that they don't get delisted. Because that's a death sentence for a company. If you're delisted from one of these major exchanges, it's so hard to raise money via, via um, selling your stock. You could still sell, issue bonds to raise money, but. All right, treasury stock. What is treasury stock? Treasury stock, these are shares of stock that the company has already issued. So they're outstanding, but then the company bought them back. So they're no longer outstanding. Uh, why would the company buy back shares? There's a little excerpt in the book. I can't remember what page it's on. It's in chapter 11. It gives several good reasons, interesting reasons. You should read them of uh, why a company would uh, repurchase, you know, buyback shares that they've previously issued. So I won't talk about those now, but let's talk about the accounting for them. I won't talk about the reasons why they would do it, but here's the accounting for it. So suppose um, the company buys back 200 shares of its common stock and they pay the shareholders $15 a share to buy them back. Uh, 200 times $15 is 3,000. So $3,000 worth of treasury stock they have. So they would credit cash, 3,000, because they, they uh, gave up cash. And then they would debit treasury stock. So treasury stock is a, is a contra uh, owner's equity account. Um, which means owner's equity accounts have a normal credit balance. Treasury stock has a normal debit balance. So when we debit treasury stock, we are, um, we are increasing treasury stock, but we're decreasing owner's equity. We're buying back ownership. So no longer the owners of our company uh, we've reduced their ownership by three thousand dollars when we buy the treasuries when we buy the stock from them that's what treasury stock is now what happens if we we have these 200 shares that we bought back what happens if we later we resell 100 of these 200 shares um, for 20 dollars a share what's the journal entry well we're going to debit cash for 2000 100 times 20 and we've just gotten rid of our treasury stock. So we're gonna reduce treasury stock with a credit, but we can't credit treasury stock um, for more than what we originally paid for it. So we credit treasury stock for what we originally paid for it. What did we originally pay for these 100 shares that we're now reselling? We originally paid 15 to buy them back. So we credit treasury stock for 100 times 15, And the additional $5 per share, the difference between the 20 and the 15, this is what we bought the treasury stock for. This is what we're selling it for. This difference of $5 a share times 100 shares, $500, it's just additional paid in capital treasury stock. All right, let's um, talk about dividends, cash dividends and stock dividends. 
I know I'm going kind of fast today, but uh, my last two uploads, lecture uploads have been two hours. So today it won't be two hours for sure. There isn't as much in this chapter. So cash dividends. Now let me make a point. The PowerPoint presentation in regards to cash dividends and stock dividends does not do it justice. You're going to have to go to the book and uh, look at, I mean, you're gonna have to go to the chat. I would read the chapter for sure, but especially for these two topics, um, they don't even show you the journal entries or anything. Uh, a cash dividend is just a distribution of cash. Well, dividend in general is a distribution of either cash or stock to owners. Cash is the most common form of dividend. Sometimes companies will give a stock dividend. Most of the time, if they're going to give a dividend, it's going to be cash. Dividends are not required to be paid. However, once the company declares that they're going to pay the dividend, then they have an obligation to do so. So they do become a liability once they are declared. And don't even look at this journal entry. Um, this isn't really what the entry would be when we pay the dividend. And the reason is, we're, we're going to pay a dividend that we previously declared. So when we previously declared it, we set up a liability. Now when we pay it, we have to get rid of the liability. But I don't see any liability here. So this, this journal entry is, it's technically correct, but it's, it's grossly, um, uh, it's doing lots of steps all in one. And by doing that, you completely miss what you're supposed to do. So I'm going to go and show you exactly what, what the journal entry should be for cash dividends. Notice that um, dividends, they're not an expense. They don't show up on the income statement. They're just a direct reduction of retained earnings. So let's, um, let's go to, I'm gonna come back to the PowerPoints, but let's go to the book, page 537. That's where they discuss the cash dividends. I would definitely read this, but we can go through this quickly. So with dividends, cash or stock, there are three dates. There's the date of declaration. This is the date that we declare to our um, shareholders. Hey, we're going to give you guys a dividend. There's the date that we actually give the dividend. That's called the payment date. That comes after the declaration date. And then in between those two dates, there's a date called the date of record. The date of record is the date such that if you own a stock, if you own a share of stock as of this date, you're entitled to get the dividend on the payment date, even if you sell your stock before the payment date. So as long as you own, in this example, as long as you own the stock on May 15th, you're gonna get the dividend on June 1st, even if you sold your stock on May 16th. Now there's a couple of technicalities to that, but I'm not gonna go into that. Just, just what I said there, just kind of remember that. So what that means is if you find out a company has declared a dividend, say you don't even own this company's stock, but you find out via social media or via just looking online, hey, Apple's paying, a, uh, they declared a dividend, on April 25th and they're gonna pay it on June 1st. Hey, I want, that, I want some of that dividend. I'm gonna go buy some Apple stock. Say you go buy Apple on May 13th. As long as you own Apple on or before May 15th, no, you have to own Apple as of May 15th. So you say you buy it May 13th. You hold it and you sell it on May 16th. You're gonna get the dividend on June 1st. If you buy it on the 13th of May and you sell it on May 14th, you're not going to get the dividend on June 1st. So this is a pretty cool thing in regards to dividends. You can actually make some money by doing this. Just shop around. All right, uh, cash dividend. Um, let's just go to the journal entries. So here's an example. Suppose a company has a thousand shares, each share is a hundred dollar par value and say it's uh, they have a thousand shares of, of preferred stock and 6,000 shares of common stock. 
outstanding. The common stock has a $10 par value per share. The preferred stock has a $100 par value per share. But the preferred stock is 6% preferred stock. The 6% is talking about dividends. In other words, if the company Smith & Sons decides to declare a dividend, the preferred shareholders are entitled to 6%, a 6% of par value per share dividend times the number of shares to get the total dollar value. They're entitled to that first, and if there's any money left over, then the common shareholders will get some. Um, so let's just say the company, let's make this simple. Let's say the company declares, uh, the way the question would word on an exam, so this is, this is actually giving it to you a little more detail. Than, but on an exam, it would just say, suppose the company declares an 18,000, they're gonna pay $18,000 dividend. And the question is, how much go to the preferred shareholders and how much goes to the common shareholders? Well, the preferred shareholders would get uh, 6% times $100. So that's $6 par value, so $6 per share dividend. And there's a thousand shares of preferred stock outstanding. So uh, the preferred shareholders would get $6,000. And you're like, okay, there's money left over because they're paying an $18,000 dividend. So the rest goes to the common shareholders. The other 12,000 goes to the common shareholders. So the journal entry that the company makes, Smith & Sons, makes on the declaration date, even though they haven't paid anything yet, is they debit an account called dividends, but we want to be specific because we could pay stock dividend. So we're going to call this cash dividends, not just dividends, but cash dividends. Uh, cash dividends is a temporary account right here. And it is closed out to retained earnings at the end of the year. So at the end of the year, whatever the balance of cash dividends is, we credit cash dividends and we debit retained earnings. But so on the date of declaration, we debit cash dividends for the dollar amount that we're declaring we're going to pay. We're going to credit two liabilities. The first liability represents the dividends that we're promising our preferred shareholders. And the second liability represents the dollars that we're promising our common shareholders. And I talked about how to calculate each of these numbers. Now, on the dividend payment date, when we actually pay the dividend, then we credit cash for 18,000 and we get rid of those two liabilities with two debits. And no journal entry is made on the date of record. The date of record is that middle date. That's just a date that the company looks at their record book, which is just a book of all the people who own stock. If your name is on that, in that book, on that date, you're getting the dividend. And so no journal entry is made on that date. It's just a date that they keep track of who gets the dividend. So we have two journal entries, one on the date of declaration, one on the date of payment. So that's, those are cash dividends. And then let's look at stock dividends. With stock dividends, let's go back to the PowerPoints. Again, the PowerPoints don't do it justice. With um, stock dividends, there are two types. Um, there's a small stock dividend and there is a uh, large stock dividend. Yeah, and this doesn't do it justice. So we'll, um, let's go look at an example from the book. So a small stock dividend, how do you decide if a, if a stock dividend is gonna be a small stock dividend or a large stock dividend? Well, it depends on the total stair, total number of shares that are outstanding before you give this before you give the stock dividend. Um, if the dividend, if the number of shares that you're saying you're going to issue as a dividend to your current shareholders, if the number of shares is less than 25% of the total shares that are already out there, then it's a small stock dividend. Small stock dividends are recorded at market value. Large stock dividend is if you're giving, if the number of shares you're gonna give is 25% or greater of what's already out there, then it's a large stock dividend. 
large stock dividends are recorded at par value. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's, here's the example. Um, suppose Smith & Sons, suppose their stockholders' equity looks like this. Prior, prior, before, they declare a 10% stock dividend. So we're looking at their stockholders' equity. First, their common stock, there's 20,000 shares that have been issued and, and are outstanding. They have a $5 par value. And they're going to, um, they're talking about a 10% stock dividend. So that's 2,000 share dividend they're going to give, 10% of 20,000. That's a small stock dividend. I mean, we know, we know it's small because 10 is less than 25. They even, but if they said, if instead of saying 10% stock dividend, if they said a 2,000 share dividend, then you have to decide, is that small or large? You just take 2,000 and divide it by the shares that are outstanding. If we get something less than 25%, then it's a small stock dividend. So what's the journal entry? Remember, stock dividends are recorded at market value. Uh, small stock dividends are recorded at market value. Large stock dividends are recorded at par value. So the journal entry, we're going to debit an account. Instead of cash dividends, we're going to debit stock dividends for market value. 2,000 shares times not the $5 share par value, but the $11 per share market value. So you have to go look at the current market value of the shares. So we're going to debit stock dividends for $22,000. 2,000 shares times the market value per share. This is on the date of declaration. When we declare, we're going to pay a stock dividend, a small stock dividend on the date of declaration before we've actually given any shares, we make this journal entry. Debit stock dividends for the market value. Credit an account called stock dividend distributable. It's kind of like a liability, but it's not. It's not a liability. It's, it's, a, it's an owner's equity. It increases owner's equity. It's a temporary account. Once we pay the stock dividend, then we're going to reduce this account. So that we credit stock dividend distributable for the par value. So the 2,000 shares times the $5 a share. And then the additional amount is credited to additional paid in capital in excess of par. All right, notice that owner's equity doesn't change with this journal entry. The debit to stock dividends reduces owner's equity. And these two credits increase owner's equity. Owner's equity remains unchanged. All right. So that's on the date of declaration. On the date of distribution, when we actually give the stock dividend, I, will, I won't say payment date because you don't pay stock. You pay cash, but you distribute shares. So on the date of distribution, um, we... We give the 2,000 shares to the people, to our shareholders, and uh, we would get rid of the stock dividend distributable account because we just gave the shares. We no longer have to give them that. So we debit stock dividends distributable for $10,000, and we credit common stock for $10,000. Again, owner's equity doesn't change. And then finally, at the end of the year, um, we get rid of this stock dividends account. We close it out to retained earnings. Credit stock dividends, debit retained earnings. We also do that to cash dividends, although they don't have that journal entry up here at the end of the year. We would debit retained earnings for 18,000, credit cash dividends 18,000 to close out the cash dividends account. That's how dividends get into retained earnings. You, you close out these temporary accounts. All right. The key thing with a stock dividend, before stock dividend, total owner's equity, 185,000. Right, we had our $100,000 common, common, uh, $100, of common stock. That's 20,000 shares outstanding times a $5 par value. Then we had additional paid in capital in excess of, of par, 20,000. That was given to us on the previous page, right here. And then we had our retained earnings of 65,000. So total owner's equity, 185,000, right? Retained earnings plus common stock. There's no preferred stock in this company. And then after the stock dividend, our common stock goes up to 110,000. 
right? Because we credited common stock right here for 10,000. Our additional paid in capital goes up to 32,000 from 20 to 32 because we credited additional paid in capital for 12 right here, right here in this bottom. And then, so our total paid in capital goes up to 142. And then our retained earnings goes from 65 down to 43, right? Stock dividends are paid out of retained earnings. We debited retained earnings right here. We reduced it by 22,000. And so our owner's equity after the stock dividend is the same. Our total shares that are outstanding, common shares, went from 20,000 up to 22,000, right? Because we issued them a dividend of 2,000 shares. So all a stock dividend does is it increases the number of shares outstanding, but it does not increase the dollar value of owner's equity. Um, a large stock dividend, the journal entries would be um, very similar, only instead of uh, recording them at market value, we record them at par value. Does it give, uh, here, I'll, it doesn't give the journal entries, but I can tell you, um, let's suppose, let's go back, if, let's do an example if this was a large stock dividend. Suppose the number of shares that we're going to give a dividend is a uh, 15,000 share dividend. Now, the shares outstanding at the time we decide to give the dividend is 20,000, are 20,000. So 15,000 shares that we're wanting to give it as a dividend divided by the 20,000, that's greater than 25%. That's greater than or equal to 25%. So it's a large stock dividend. So what's the journal entry? for these, the date that we declare this 15,000 share dividend. All right, we would debit stock dividends, not for market value, but for par value. So debit stock dividends for 15,000 shares times $5 per share par value. That's what that number would be. And then we would credit stock dividend distributable for the same number. And there is no additional paid in capital in excess of par because we're not doing anything with market value. Market value is 11, that's an excess of par of five, but we're not do it, dealing with market value. We're recording at a par, so there's nothing, there's nothing here. So it would just be debit stock dividends for 15,000 shares times $5 a share, credit stock dividend distributable for the same thing. On the date of declaration. On the date of distribution, debit stock dividend distributable for whatever you credit it for up here, and then credit common stock for the same amount. And then, at the end of the year, you close out stock dividends to retain earnings. So that's a large stock dividend example. Simpler than, a, the journal entries are slightly simpler. All right, that takes care of uh, dividends. The statement of retained earnings and the statement of stockholders equity. I mean, we've already talked about these things earlier in the course. Statement of retained earnings provides an analysis of how retained earnings changed during the period. Uh, most companies don't have a separate statement of retained earnings. They include the statement of retained earnings or this part on the statement of stockholders equity. Some companies take that and put it in its own statement. It's just the retained earnings equation. Beginning retained earnings plus net income minus the cash dividends declared equals the ending retained earnings. If you declare it, it's got to show, if you declare a dividend, it's got to go on the statement of retained earnings. Obviously, if you pay the dividend, it's on there as well, but suppose you declared it right before the end of the year, but you hadn't paid it yet. Does it go on this year's statement of retained earnings? Yes. Once you declare it, it's not, you have an obligation to pay it. And here's the statement of stockholders equity. You've seen this before, we have our common stock, our additional paid in capital in excess of par common stock, um, any additional paid in capital from treasury stock. We have our treasury stock here. We have our retained earnings. The reason these things are all listed before treasury stock is because all of these increase owner's equity. Treasury stock decreases owner's equity. So whatever the balance in treasury stock is at the beginning or at the end of a year, we have to subtract that balance so that's why there's a, um, 
parentheses. So these are beginning balances. Then we have any, any, any um, increases to these columns during the year. Like here's an increase to common stock. Here's an increase to the paid in capital. Here's an increase paid in capital from treasury stock. Here's the net income that increases retained earnings. Then we have any decreases. Here's a decrease for dividends declared. Here's an increase for treasury stock. We bought back, we bought some, um, no. This is where we bought the treasury stock from our shareholders that decreases owner's equity. Here's where we resold the treasury stock to our shareholders. If you recall in the previous, in the earlier example, we resold 100 shares of the 200 we had bought from them. And we recorded that 100 at $15. Uh, yeah, 15, I can't remember exactly, but you can go back and look. The, the, these numbers should line up with the, those numbers. And then you have your ending balances. Calculated as just beginning plus the change for each column. And then finally in this chapter, we usually, it, you can see the pattern in previous chapters. We leave the, um, the ratios and stuff for the very end. So in this chapter, we have what we have return on, return on equity, dividend yield, and dividend payout ratio. So these are uh, three ratios that we use to analyze owner's equity. So a ratio of particular interest to both current sh common shareholders and people who are going to be potential shareholders are thinking about buying shares is return on owner's equity, return on common owner's equity. So the ratio um, return on common stockholders equity, it measures the profitability of the common stockholders investment in the company. Like if you give money to a company and get shares in return, it's an investment. And so what you do is um, in the numerator, we take the net income the company made minus any dollars they gave to preferred shareholders for dividends, because we didn't get any of that. And then we divide, so th this in the numerator, essentially our return. And then we divide that by our average investment. And so it gives this, this ratio gives us our rate of return. So numerator is our dollar return. The idea is whatever the company's dollars in that income minus what they gave to the preferred shareholders, that's what they have left. If they wanted, they could give to us. They don't have to give it to us in the form of a dividend, but at least if this number is bigger and bigger and bigger, the value of our shares on the stock exchange will go up and up. So it's related to this numerator. This is our return. Divide that by our investment. This is our investment. It's the average investment, right? It's the common stockholders equity balance at the beginning of the year plus the common stockholders equity balance at the end of the year divide by two. This is essentially our investment, right? Whatever the, that dollar value is, it's the, it's the par value. It's what we've given to the company. Um, it's the par value though, right? Because common stock is always recorded at par. So this is the rate of return. Obviously the bigger the ROE, the better. You guys have probably heard of this acronym ROE. Well, this is ROE. Return on equity. So if you're a potential shareholder, you're, you're shopping around deciding on which, uh, which companies you wanna buy stock in, you can, you can rank them from you know, best to worst in terms of this ratio. So some investors prefer to get a dividend because it's, it's less risky, right? At least I know I get that as cash. And other investors, they don't want the company to pay them a dividend because then that means the company has to pay money out. They want the company to take that money and invest it in more profitable projects. And hopefully this, their stock price will go up even higher. So some people think if companies pay too many dividends, their stock price can, there's a ceiling. The stock price can't go up very high. You know, it can't go up as highly as it could if they just, kept that money and you know, invested it in more profitable projects. Uh, I'm an investor who kind of believes that. Um, I'd rather just not get a dividend, just pour it back into the company, pour it back into their operations. Hopefully my, my stock will go up in value on the market and I can sell it. 
uh, so one measure of the, of the dividend policy of a company is the dividend yield. The numerator is the annual dividend per share. And we divide that by the market price per share. So companies, some companies give a dividend every year. In fact, the companies who give frequent dividends, they do it every quarter. So every three months, every quarter of a year, they give a dividend. Um, but if you want to find this dividend yield, you take the annual dividend per share um, and divide it by the market price per share. The higher, um, the higher this yield, the more aggressive they are in terms of giving dividends. The lower this yield, the less aggressive they are in terms of giving. In other words, the bigger the dividend yield, the more dividends they give, the less dividend yield, the smaller the dividend yield, the less dividends they give. And technically, the dividend yield measures the rate of return in cash dividends from an investment in the company's common stock. Right? Because this is your investment. You have to, for, for one share of stock, you have to pay this, this price. Suppose you buy a, a one share of Walmart and it's trading for $50 a share. So there's your investment. How do you find a rate of return? You divide your return in dollars by your investment in dollars. So this is your investment. And then your return in the form of a dividend is whatever the dividend they paid for that share. So suppose you got a you know, $5 dividend per share. And you paid $50 for this share and they gave you $5, $5 in dividend for that share. And they do that every year, let's say. You only have to pay the 50 once though. So this rate of return annually is, uh, looks to be 10%. Not bad. No dividend, no companies um, pay 10% dividends. <laughs> That's a high number. Walmart is pretty good. They pay close to 3% usually over the course of a year. Every quarter they give, Walmart gives about this much of a dividend. So over the year, you'll get the 3%. I may be wrong in that, but I think Walmart, there's some other examples of companies that are really good on paying regular dividends. And then finally, we have the dividend payout ratio. Um, it just measures the percentage of the net income available to common shareholders that is paid out as dividends. So it's the annual dividend per share divided by our, our earnings per share. It's the dividends payout ratio. Our earnings per share, right, is our net income um, minus some stuff, don't worry about the stuff that you subtract, divide by our um, number of shares outstanding, right? That's our earnings per share outstanding. So that's in the denominator. EPS. And then the numerator is just the company's dividend per share. Could be like Five dollars per share, likely not that much. That'd be too, that'd be a lot. So you divide that by the earnings per share, and it that's the, it gives a measure of the dividend payout ratio. You know, what ratio of earnings for each share is paid out in the form of dividends? And this is a true statement. Growth companies typically have low dividend payout ratios. They don't want to pay out any excess, any cash they have from their operations, any net, you know, any income they have. They don't want to pay it out to their shareholders. They want to reinvest it, you know, to fund additional growth. More mature companies like Walmart, for example, that don't have growth opportunities, they tend to have higher dividend payout ratios. So Walmart dividend payout ratio, much bigger than Facebook dividend payout ratio. I don't even know if Facebook pays a dividend. Um, all right, select the correct answer. What's their ROE? Net income 100,000, average owner's equity of 400,000. They paid this many dollars to their preferred shareholders this year, and they paid this many dollars to their common shareholders this year. So let's go back to the formulas. ROE was 
It's net income minus the money you've paid to your preferred shareholders divided by average owner's equity. So it's return on common shareholders equity. The E here doesn't mean return on total stockholders equity. It mean, the E means return, it's the common stockholders equity. So that's why we take our 100,000 net income. That's the return on total equity. Subtract the dollars that we pay to our preferred shareholders. So the return on common, on, on common equity is 80,000 divided by our uh, average, uh, I think this should be average, let's see, is it average total equity? Yeah, yeah, average total in the bottom. This is the return to the common divided by the average total. So 80,000 divided by 400,000. Twenty percent, but let me look back. Uh, make sure that's no. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, return on common stockholders' equity in the denominator. We have not the average total stockholders' equity, but just the average common stockholders' equity. And so maybe that's kind of a, a problem here in the problem because they don't give us the average common stockholders' equity. They didn't give us that. They gave us the average total stockholders' equity. So I guess technically there's not enough information to answer the question, but I think it's just a typo. All right, I believe that concludes this, um, that concludes uh, Stockholders' Equity, Chapter 11. Are there any questions? I went quickly through the lecture. You're gonna have to read, read the chapter and do, you know, obviously do the homework and study some, but does anyone have any initial questions? Anything I say during the lecture? Uh, trigger a question. We have one. Is tomorrow's lecture at 11.40? 11.40, you're right. I think I said 11 earlier in the lecture, that tomorrow's lecture would be at 11 a.m. Yes, Anthony, 11.40. We'll keep it the same time, just so, because that's the time that we always lecture. I know tomorrow's Friday. We don't usually do Friday, but yes, tomorrow, Friday, 11.40 a.m., to 1.05 p.m. We will work chapter 11 problems tomorrow. And uh, I will send you guys the Zoom link uh, today whenever I, whenever I get done here. I'll send you an email with the Zoom link. Uh, no office hours tomorrow though, just the lecture. Obviously, if you wanna to talk to me about anything you're having trouble with, email me and we'll set up a Zoom one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you, Anthony. Any other questions? All righty then. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and I will uh, upload this to YouTube as soon as I end the lecture. Give it probably an hour before you see it on YouTube. Have a good day and I'll see you tomorrow.